Hello, all, and welcome back to 90.3 WMFC. I am Kyle Pepitone, aka the Kingpin Parentheses of Stades, and alongside Emily Emo McCormack, we are joined here with American singer Diamante, whose music has appeared a number of times on this station before. Uh, thank you for coming in, first of all. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you guys so much for having me. Of course. And before we begin, I just want to say congratulations. Uh, just recently, your second studio album, American Dream, celebrated its one year anniversary. Yeah. That's absolutely amazing. How, how, how does that feel, first off? It feels surreal, A, that it's already been a year because I feel like it just came out. Um, it feels very rewarding because this album was like my baby. So the fact that it's now been out in the world for a year, so many people have gotten the opportunity to not only listen to it, but to make the songs of their own, to message me in ways that the songs have helped them or made them feel better about a certain thing. It's just the most incredible thing ever. Right. And it's funny you should say making the songs your own because in contrast to your first album, Coming In Hot, there's a very different set of themes within this yeah. album, where Coming In Hot was more uh, focused more on songs from a position of strength and power. Uh, American Dream looks more at mistrust, betrayal, accountability. And so mm -hmm. what inspired you to take this more introspective approach while writing the second album? I think the biggest factor was me growing as a songwriter really that's the biggest thing because when I made that first album I don't think I was ready yet to show the world all the not so awesome parts of Diamante the vulnerable parts the parts I'm ashamed of the parts that I don't openly talk about very much and on this album I sort of just stripped away all those barriers because I realized that the songs where you do go there and you do sort of address the things that you don't necessarily want to say, those are the things that people relate to the most. That's the kind of music that helps people the most. And I know that just being a music listener myself. So I really had to push myself on this album. And I'm so glad that I did because then all these songs came out of me that I didn't know existed, like Unlovable or Ghost Myself. Right. And with this more uh, personal style of songs that you put out in this album did it affect your writing process in any way or did you change your writing process in order to write these different types of songs in comparison to your first album i would say that writing these songs was actually easier in a way it was a little more fluid because i wasn't holding back as much and when I would go into a writing session, it was really almost word vomit. It was all these things that I was feeling and I would say them in a very direct conversational way. And that's how they would translate later then onto the song. There was no hidden metaphor, no uh, sort of veil to hide behind. So it was very direct and it, an American dream. I think the lyrics are very conversational because that's how the songwriting sessions were. Um, American Dream was your first album after breaking ties with your label Better Noise Music. What are some of the differences between working on your album with the label versus working on one independently? Because one of the things that you've mentioned in the past is while working on this album, you wanted to make it sound as much you as possible. Yeah, I would say they're vastly different in a lot of ways. There's a lot of pros to being with a label. There's a lot of cons to being with a label there's a lot of pros to being independent and there's a lot of cons so that first album I didn't have a lot of say on many of the aspects going into that album I didn't get to choose the cover on that album I didn't get to choose the songs that made the album the songs that didn't make the album the name of the album the album cover <laughs> like the list goes on a lot of it was not my choice but I got this incredible push that kind of catapulted me to where I am today that made it so that I could put out an album independently and have it well received by people, heard by a lot of people. Um, American Dream, because it was really just me and my producers, I had all the creative say in the world, which was like a brave new world for me. I couldn't believe that I got to decide the track list, the songs, um, like the album title, the cover, everything I didn't get to decide before. I got to decide this time. But with that said, I had all this extra pressure on me because 
if the album doesn't do well, then it's really just my fault and nobody else's. There's nobody else to blame. This is my vision. So there was a lot more at stake, I think. And with after releasing an album independently, is there any advice you would give somebody working on an album who is also probably working with a uh, skeleton crew kind of thing, which just where it's probably just like them and their friends? Yeah, absolutely. I would say find really creative ways to have that music heard because there's a lot more work now that has to be done. You don't have this gigantic label, you know, putting you on playlists or, or doing radio campaigns. It's really all on you. So what I did was I turned to TikTok. I made a bunch of videos leading up to the release of the album. And the great thing is that anybody can do that. You don't need a label to make content, to, uh, to promote your songs before they come out and help gain traction. Another thing I would say, which is a possibility now, is go out on tour, play as many shows as you can. And that's really the best way to get new fans to hear your music. That's what I did this last, I guess, six months, eight months, finally got to tour the American Dream album and it gives the music a whole new different life. Yeah, while, while preparing for this interview, we came across a story where you had to leave in the middle of class in order to record a song with Tommy Vex of Bad Wolves. How do you balance your music career and your schooling? It was really difficult back then, and I had to do crazy stuff like that. I would have to get up out of class and leave and go to the studio an hour and a half away and explain to my teachers later on, like, I really had to do that. I'm so sorry. Uh, ever since high school, it was always a juggling act. And then actually the last two years or so when the pandemic hit and there was no touring, there was really nothing musically going on in my life except making the album. I had the opportunity to stay home and to really focus on school full time. And because of that, I was able to finish finally, finish college, get my degree. And I don't think that would have happened if I hadn't been home the last two years. So I kind of see it as not a blessing, but I try to make the best of every situation. So I said to myself, if I don't get to go out on tour, I'm at least going to do something else to fill up my time to something that I wasn't able to do before because of touring. So in normal life, it's a juggle, but I got lucky because the last two years I was able to just do it and not stop until I was done. How did your professor react to you leaving class? She was actually really cool. She understood. Um, it always depends. I kind of, depending on the teacher, would let them know like, yeah, you know, I do music or I would just keep it completely shushed because <laughs> in high school, I didn't have the best experience with fellow classmates or teachers knowing that I did music. It kind of, uh. for some reason, I got bullied a lot by kids who knew that I wanted to become a singer and then teachers just didn't take, I mean, I was 15, so I don't blame them. They didn't take it like a serious thing. Right. They thought I was kind of just trying not to show up to school or like I missed this <laughs> test for another reason. It's not because you're playing a show. You know? um, but then in college, I think because I'm older, I think the teachers take it a little more serious and the ones that were cool, I would tell them, yeah, you know, sometimes I tour and I take semesters off and then I come back and I'm trying to finish this degree. And that teacher in particular, she was really cool. She understood and she's like, don't worry about it. Just give me a heads up next time. <laughs> yeah, gotta keep the, your fingers crossed that you get the cool professors. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. And since that initial uh, collaboration with Bad Wolves, you've since worked with other bands such as Breaking Benjamin on your cover of Iris by the Google Dolls. And not to mention, uh, you released another version of American Dream, the song uh, with the band Lit uh, that we played a couple of weeks ago on the, uh, Heavy is the Crown. Um, moving forward, what other artists is on your like dream repertoire to work with? And what other songs would you like to cover? Oh my gosh, there are so many artists I would love to work with in my genre and also outside of my genre. Um, I mean, in my genre, I'd love to do a song with Lizzie Hale from Hailstorm. Oh, I think she's yes. incredible. Uh, I would love to do a song with Lady Gaga. I would love to do a song with um, Lana Del Rey. There's like all these 
female artists actually that I really look up to that I would love to one day collaborate with. It just so happens that up until this point, it's always been male artists, but I would love to do right. some type of collaboration with a female artist down the road. Um, songs that I'd like to cover. I really love the 80s. All 80s music is my favorite thing. So anything by um, Pat Benatar or Blondie or even Joan Jett or Stevie Nicks, I think would be so cool. Cool. Um, you've mentioned that you grew up listening to The Pretty Reckless and have also just finished touring with them. What was it like not only meeting a band you've grown up listening to, but also working with them? It was so crazy. I would, uh, when I was 15 and I was in high school and I was, you know, not having the best time, I'd come home and I'd put on bands like The Pretty Reckless specifically and Shine Down and Breaking Ben and Hailstorm and I'd sing along to their to all their music to make me feel better. And that was exactly 10 years ago. So when I got the offer for this tour, I had this crazy full circle moment. Um, doing the actual tour, the pre reckless they were super nice. They sent a bottle of champagne to my dressing room. <laughs> they were like, wow, very, very cool to tour with. And I just, I couldn't believe it. And every night on stage, I would say, um, like, A, I can't believe we're playing shows again. I can't believe I get to stand on this arena stage. And I can't believe that I'm opening up for two bands that I grew up listening to. It was absolutely insane. And I, I don't think I ever got used to it. <laughs> Is it hard to, like, that initial meeting with them, like, trying not to freak out because you've grown up listening to them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's... It's better now because I, I've met a lot of bands at this point and I'm really right. I'm like, okay, you know, we're all people. We all just make music and that's what we do. And uh, I obviously respected them like crazy, but I wasn't like, oh my God, I listen to you guys and this is so cool. <laughs> I try <laughs> to keep my composure as much as I can while letting them know that I am a fan of what they do. Right. That's awesome. Um, do you have any favorite moments of the recent tour that you could share with us? And were there any like funny or crazy touring moments? Oh, that, that's such a good question. Um, the first night of the tour, I did this thing and I didn't know if it was going to, if I was going to be able to pull it off because I was opening the show, but I told the whole arena to put up their lights during Iris. And when the entire place lit up the arena and I could see like thousands of lights just shining back at me I had this crazy moment of like wow this is this is it this is what I've been working so hard towards and I think I started crying because it was really emotional that first time it happened um I think we me and my band found a lot of awesome places to eat food on days off I found like the coolest hole in the wall spots um what else Oh, Mall of America. We went to Mall of America in the blizzard. That was fun. And uh, it's like, it's such a blur when you think back on touring, but that was, that was a great tour. Also, uh, Shinedown bringing me a platter of homemade ribs to my bus. That was up there. That was What? Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a pork shoulder a second time. And they brought me like the barbecue sauce, the buns. They're the coolest band to open up for. Now, the most important question, were the ribs good? They were incredible. Oh, they okay. That's all that matters then. <laughs> I think a few of them are from Memphis, so they know how to make ribs. Ah, uh, that explains it. And uh, for the audience, if you're just tuning in, my name is Kyle Peppertone, and along with Emily McCormack, we are here with American singer Diamante. And before the break, we discussed her music and her career, and now we're going to shift over to talk about college radio. Uh, as you know, nowadays, there are many different platforms and ways where people can listen to music, find new music, the whole nine yards. But within the rise of the convenience in streaming services, why is college radio, why do you believe college radio is still important to both people and artists alike? I think a big part of it is the community. I think, uh, I mean, I can say this because I went to college. I know the community factor of going to a school is huge. And I think a lot of people love listening to college radio because it reminds them of the community that they're in while 
listening to music. And I hope it never goes away. I love the fact that college radio is still going strong. Yeah. On the other hand, even though streaming services have become the new norm, there's been a large revival for vinyl over the past few years. Why do you yeah. think so many people are collecting and listening to vinyl when streaming services are so easily available and more convenient? I honestly think that the pandemic had a big factor as to why people love uh, vinyl now. I think the fans were missing the live experience. I think they wanted to feel close to their favorite artists and owning that physical product was a way to do that and to collect. I think we had a lot more time to collect stuff, to, to have new hobbies. And I love that vinyl is back. I love vinyl. I love designing vinyl. I can't wait to put out more vinyl. So as long as it's here to stay, I'm excited. Yeah. Which, which is your preferred method of music? That's a good question. Um, I, do, I do stream a lot of music. Um, but I love CDs, if I'm being honest. I love CD players. I love putting it into, like putting one into a CD player and just blasting music in my room and singing along because that's what I did growing up. So it's really nostalgic for me. I'm with you on that one. I like the CDs just because like, I don't know, they're compact. And like I was telling yeah. Emily before the interview, most cars come with a CD player. You're not going to find many cars with a record player inside right. of them. So, <laughs> right. you know, it's got the travel factor. And also the lyric booklet. That was my favorite part of owning mm -hmm. CDs. I loved getting to read the lyrics and the liner notes and yes. the pictures. Like that was the best part. Oh, 100%. I, as a lyricist myself, that I feel like knowing the words to the song is one of the most important parts. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we just have a few more questions uh, to wrap up with. Um, number one, just as a little fun question, if there was any movie franchise or TV show that you're a fan of, which one would you like to have the opportunity of writing for? Oh, that's a good one. Um, if I could write for any TV show, or movie franchise, I would say Stranger Things, just uh, because it's like very uh, 80s and vintage, and it's got this rock and roll feels, and it's dark and it's creepy. I would love to do something for them. Yeah. And at the time of recording this interview, I think part one of the new season releases in like two days. Yes, I'm <laughs> so excited. I can't wait. Yeah, definitely. As mentioned earlier, American Dream just celebrated its one year anniversary and you recently finished your tour with Shinedown and the Pretty Reckless. What big things can we expect to see from Diamante in the future? So I actually leave for Europe in three weeks and that's the first time I'm ever going there to play shows, to perform. I have a couple festivals lined up in Europe and some headline shows, and I'm so excited. I've been waiting years to finally go over to Europe. The fans have been asking me, when are you coming? When are you coming? So I'm so, so excited. Um, uh, there's a, actually another show with Shinedown on August 28th because we had to reschedule the very last one of the tour, so that's gonna be cool. And, uh, that, that's the summer and I'm almost back in the studio, really diving into the new music already. So definitely busy. Awesome. And if people wanted to keep up to date with the new tour or any new music you possibly put out in the future, uh, where can they find you? The easiest way would be thisisdiamante.com. It has all the links to music, it has the tour dates, it has everything condensing to one website. So that's the easiest. This is diamante.com. Awesome. Uh, once again, for our listeners, Diamante's second studio album, American Dream, is out and available on all streaming platforms. Per uh, we would like to personally thank you on behalf of WMSC and all other college radio stations uh, for coming here, taking time out of your schedule to do this interview for uh, with us. We look forward to hearing what you have coming up next. Absolutely. Thank you guys so, so much for having me. Of course. Thank you so much.